The What Podcast. Which bands this year that matter? Look. Looky, looky, looky. The team's back. We got Brad back. Eric Porter, Brad Steiner, Lord Taco. Thanks for dressing up today. Yeah, I put on <laughs> pants. He's got that okay. 70s, uh, what is it, that uh, aerobics uh, collar thing going. Did you, <laughs> did you cut that yourself? 70s aerobics collar. <laughs> 80s, whatever. Did you cut that collar out yourself? Yeah, when I think of Lord Taco, I yeah. think of aerobics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a maniac, that guy. Uh-huh. What have you guys been up to? I haven't seen you forever. Missing you. I miss you. Maybe yeah. missing you. Uh, You're all moved in. I'm glad. Do you see? Do you like the new set? I love it. I feel like Oprah, yeah. and I've got a brand new set to show off. I love it. Love it. Yeah. Glad you guys. What are if it's all just a green screen? I made this up. I just like a taco. It's not even real. Yeah, this is a green screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's everything in New York? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's getting there. It's been a it's been a tough um landing to to be uh totally honest the the move was a little stressful the um getting the stuff was a little stressful but nothing will top the stress of um bringing in two dogs to a city and one of the dogs not knowing how to shit on a leash yeah we had several discussions Can I tell you the stress and the worry and the anxiety of every moment that you're in this house he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna take it do you, do you want to and, sh- and then we do you want and then sh- you take him outside he's just he's got so much add because he doesn't know what in the world he's, he's sitting in like nothing around him is is well, he's a southern, everything's new he's a southern dog and you moved him he's, up into the big city he's a new Orleans dog you doubt debutante took babe into the big city i took babe into the big babe. city yeah, yeah. That's what I did. <laughs> so that was a, a little strained but I, I feel like uh last weekend we finally got uh, sort of our feet under us you know we we live right next to prospect park which is this beautiful beautiful park so we spent damn near all day getting lost in there and it, it finally started to feel comfortable i'm not gonna lie to you no man i really miss the walls i really 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 miss yeah, it. especially right now with jazz fest going on and it's crawfish season oh god seeing my friends post about crawfish and jazz fest i literally want to get off of social media just delete Delete. Have you not yeah, found a crawfish yeah. place there in, in New York yet? You know, you it turns gone out, down the street uh, and ask them for a little crawfish. You want to suck the head? You no, know, I, I, I like think to that be you there could when probably, you <laughs> I think you could probably go down Long Island and find some you know, like Chinese crawfish, but no, no, it's not the same. In fact, I, I even contacted a guy named Crawfish. He actually the Bonnaroo crawfish guy. He will mail you crawfish, boiled or live. Um, and so if I wanted to, I could get like 10 pounds of live crawfish live. and do like a boil at my, on my stove. I don't know. <laughs> I've got to figure out how to do this because I am dying. Nice. Well, go down the street there to your, your bar and ask for my some, bo- some, my sweet, bodega some, and ask yeah, for some crawfish. sweet tea and some crawfish. And yeah. Let, uh-huh. me know, you, let me know how that goes. Have you found a pals replacement yet? Oh, so pals, I do have a funny story about a uh, bar. So, you know, everybody, if you listen to this show, you know, my favorite bar in the world is a place called Pals in my neighborhood, New Orleans. It's the greatest bar I've ever been to in my life. So we take a stroll around our new neighborhood here in Brooklyn, and I found a bar literally a block away from me called Best Friends. Best Friends. How ironic <laughs> is I go from Pals to Best Friends. I couldn't, I couldn't I find a Chums? No, I <laughs> Yeah, if I ever move again, it's to become acquaintances. Acquaintances, or, yeah. Uh, someone I know. I, I guy I met once. Just have a hard time seeing Brad guy at a best friends. I went to okay. Go to a pals. What's wrong with the best friends? Go to a pals. Go to a best friends. Okay, whatever. Yeah, but it's uh, it's been going okay. What about you? How's uh, how's dad? How's uh, how's Taco? Oh, how's everybody great. feeling? Everybody's great. I'm Good great. Uh, just got back from Shaky Knees in Atlanta. Oh yeah, yeah. No Shaky Knees. Shaky Knees was fantastic. I tell you what, mm-hmm. if 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 ticket Everyone. sales are down, it wasn't evident at Shaky Knees because it was just as big this year as it was last year that I could tell. I thought that Shaky actually did well. It did I, great. Uh, everything that I heard, C3 was really happy. With yeah, the number. yeah. Um, yeah, good weather too, right? Good weather. Excellent good weather. Oh, great lineup, could, obviously. Yeah, great lineup. If we could have that weather for Bonnaroo, mm, perfect. And you uh, understand you, you got to play celebrity for a little bit. 
three times. Somebody, <laughs> some in the crowd, came up to me and said, "Oh, are you, uh, you Lord Targo from the What Podcast?" I said, "Yeah." So, uh, two, two of them were named John. Weird. Uh-huh. And then, uh, then we had Aaron, who who was actually on the show back in 2020 before the everything shut down. So, nice. Pretty excited okay. to see them. I handed yeah. out stickers. Uh, I'm out of stickers now, by the way. All right. Oh right God. Okay. I've got hey, a few. We, and... I thought didn't we do? I thought we did our head stickers. Didn't we do head stickers? You did a few. Didn't we do? I haven't ordered any. Uh, we need to start doing those again, huh? Well, I'm waiting on a deal uh, from Sticker Mule. Yeah. yeah. See, Barry Sticker. I feel like I got another one around here somewhere. Well, now that I have my own head, I gotta get my own. Yeah, stickers. but yours would have to be. Congratulations. Yep, it'd be a huge sticker. Based on what? Huge. Are you you saying I got a big head? Sticker. Got yeah, it. Yeah, that, that head that Brad had made is a little oversized. Well, well, I got the digital version. I mean, they can <laughs> cut a sticker any size. Yeah. Uh, so um, so who did you see as shaking you? What was the standout show? Uh, standout show for me was Godspeed, you Black Emperor. It was absolutely unreal. I've never seen it before. Uh, what? Who? I didn't even word, know the words you just said. God, Godspeed, you Black Emperor? Is that an anime? They're, uh, they're, Dan- no, they're like, a, anime they're, like a, you, they're like a post-rock band. Um, they were, I think they were most well-known. They had a song on the 28 Days Later soundtrack. But, of course. Uh, I love that movie. What? I don't even know what movie that is. Oh, okay. Is that a movie? Oh, that's right. You don't watch They're movies. a TV show. I do. <laughs> I like movies. <laughs> Godspeed, you black emperor. Yeah, they've got a. I mean, it's like a twenty-five piece band, and it's like they've got wow. violins yeah, and drums and guitars and you know. A Canadian post-rock band which originated in Montreal in nineteen ninety-four. Uh, wow, they've been there around go. forever. Yeah, cool. All right, um, all right, the, Barry. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some names of albums from Godspeed, you Black Emperor. All right, uh, I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a name. Of the uh, album, you tell me if it's a real Godspeed, you Black Emperor name or totally made up on top of my head. Okay. Okay, number one. Lift your skinny fists like an antenna. Gotta be real. That's absolutely <laughs> yes, real. That, yes. is, that is real, yes. Of course. Uh, beyond, infinis- beyond Infinity, the cat killed curi- uh, curiosity. Sounds real. That is fake. Totally yeah. fake. Good for you. Good. All right. That's good pull. You How about me. this? All lights fucked on the hairy amp drooling. <laughs> Wait, that's a taco Twitter post. <laughs> These are taco <laughs> tweets, yes. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, that is an that's actual real. Godspeed, you Black Emperor <laughs> album. Wow. Wow. What an odd pull this is, Taco. Totally so odd. The the and the best part was their um their visuals they had they had a guy with like four projectors in the back real film projectors like eight millimeter and he was running film strips through them to project just you know colors and patterns and it was just bizarre but it was all real i mean this wasn't like a screen and at the end he would actually run it through and slow it down so it would get heated up by the by the lamps and it would just straight up burn so like the end was just like it just it was crazy cool wow it was okay very, very cool well, you, you taught me something today buddy yeah, i i cool. did not see that coming did not <laughs> see that coming um so the uh the show today is actually uh one that we've been trying to work on for you know a few years now because uh we have multiple times on the show talked to ashley caps from ac entertainment but a lot of people don't know ac entertainment had a partner when they started bonnaroo it wasn't just ac entertainment and um, it, it didn't just operate by AC Entertainment, even though for us, being right. in Chattanooga for all those years, AC Entertainment was right up the road, so they were the ones right off the top of our head, and, and we had close proximity to it. But the partners that started this whole thing with AC Entertainment was a company called Superfly. Superfly ran by four guys, one of which is Rick Farman, and Rick Farman, one of those guys that started Bonnaroo, is our guest today, uh, going deep into the history of Bonnaroo and then uh, what he's up to now and then the future of 
uh, festival life in general. It's going to be a lengthy one, a very lengthy one. Yeah, he was. He gave us a lot of time, and he could have gone another two or three hours. I don't even. I expect him to. We're going to do this again because I want touch. I know. (laughs) So I know we didn't even scratch the surface of some of the nerdy things that we really want to talk about when it comes to Bonnaroo festivals, but. Um, they also produce outside lands, and they've got another project that they're uh, going to work on too in the next uh, year or so. I, I really loved it. Rick is a um, he is a dialed in dude. Yeah, this guy I mean, knows his stuff, huh? It, it, I'm glad we got him, and you're right. We actually uh, with AC Entertainment, we've had because as you said, proximity. We've you know talked to him and Jeff Quayar. Uh, for I I don't think we you know avoided Superfly. We just never. Um, we just didn't know anybody there. Didn't know anybody there, and yep. uh, this was great. And it wasn't until I got to New Orleans where I started hearing names and, and the people that were operating Superfly. In fact, I, I didn't know Superfly was, was still uh, operating because they weren't necessarily in New Orleans anymore. It just turns out they, they just right. sprawled across the country, and they're doing uh, incredible work you know, still with outside land. So uh, that's really, really exciting today. I hope that you enjoy this. Um, it's a big one, so <laughs> you've got to uh, pause and... and and take a break, you know, do it. And if you do pause and take a break, please rate, review the show. It'd be uh, very helpful. All right, here we go. Rick Farman on the What Podcast. All right, y'all. Perfect. Look at that. Look at that dream boat. Looking Perfect. good. Try and, you know, try to match the energy on the other side here, guys. I hear you. <laughs> Where are you these that. days? <laughs> Where are, where are you set up these days? Uh, I am in Berkeley, California. Okay. Uh, because it, it's weird. Superfly has kind of taken on a little bit of a, uh, it's a sprawl these days. Uh, where is the main office now? It's Still not in New Orleans, Orleans anymore. Uh, we, we just reopened um, a new office here. Uh, I mean, a new office in New York uh, about a month, month and a half ago, something like that. Um, so, you know, uh, obviously with everybody, like everybody, we were kind of fully shut down, uh, in terms of, you know, in-person work and stuff like that. Um, how's, how big has Superfly gotten? Because the, the, isn't the legend, there are four guys and then when did it become the major entity that it is now? Yeah. Just for stars, are we, are we starting yet? We can. Okay. Just wanted. This is, this is what we do. We just, uh, we shoot the ship for a little while. Conversation. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, I I'm used to sort of just knowing when we're you know <laughs> we, when we're live, yeah. when we're going and when we're not. So yeah, but, you, you but, Barry, get... Barry knows Barry knows when he's around Brad, everything's yeah, the show. It, <laughs> everything's the show. If you see record, you better be on point because because <laughs> it'll show up some, I think, somehow. <laughs> I mean, the reason the reason I ask is because you know uh, not only do we have such a you know long history with Bonnaroo. Uh, the legend of Superfly and then AC Entertainment. And then this guy, you know, moves to New Orleans and I hear all about the Superfly cats. And then I, uh, two months ago, pick up and move to Brooklyn. And, right. you know, it seems like, it seems like I'm just following Superfly's path. Come I'm out to the like, West Coast here, man. You I, know, it good. might be next. It might be next. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, sorry, was your, what was your question about like how no, big no, no. Mayor. Yeah, how, how big has Superfly gotten these days? We're about 100 people today. Um, oh, wow. We do kind of three different things. Um, we obviously create, you know, festivals and events and experiences that we create the IP for and like we, you know, the brand and everything. We have a have long had a marketing services business, so an agency that um, helps uh, you know, different businesses create meaningful marketing programs. Um, but a lot of that kind of, frankly, got born out of uh, work we did at Bonnaroo very early on. You know, we kind of came up with this basic ethos of how we work with brand partners. And it was all around, if we're going to get a brand involved in one of our experiences, uh, there has to be a value for the fan. Right. As you know, uh, at Bonnaroo and, you know, other events that we created, we don't have your typical stage signage and presented buys and stage names and all this kind of stuff. We always felt that if a brand was going to be part of one of our experiences, then they needed to, you know, have something really tangible, you know, that the fans felt was benefiting them, that it was adding to the experience and to the community. Um, And so we did 
you know that so well early on and we onboarded a lot of brands into that kind of way of thinking that we ended up um you know kind of starting a business you know kind of a complimentary business around helping brands do stuff like that and so we, we yeah. get to do some fun stuff uh, as an example uh, this year we will be um, you know, producing uh, a bunch of different events for companies that, you know, bring together their fans, their fandom, you know, generally media companies and things like that, that have, you know, kind of uh, talent and, you know, uh, content that there's a lot of fandom around. So uh, we love to do, we love to bring communities together and people together in whatever format we can. Um, well, when it was then, just the, when it's just the four of you, how old were you when you really started getting the Superfly thing together? Yeah, so I'd say the very beginning of Superfly was um, a part-time affair, right? That was uh, really our first ever event. We actually just celebrated this past February, the 25th anniversary of the first ever Superfly show, which was uh, Take Funk to Heaven, Mardi Gras 97. Um, and uh, it was a show at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans. And um, when I say it was at the Contemporary Arts Center, I say that loosely. It was in the parking lot in a <laughs> warehouse that was half covered. Uh, so it was not in the beautiful, gorgeous building that is the Contemporary Arts Center. It was in their ramshackled, uh, you know, parking lot. And um, uh, so that was the, the, you know, the beginning of it was really doing things like Mardi Gras, Jazz Fest. Then we started to become a regular concert promoter. And it wasn't until uh, kind of I graduated that it was like a full time thing, right? So that was you know a few years later, nineteen really probably two thousand was when we were kind of like, okay, let's see if we can do this for a living. Wow. And what I mean by that is like, can we pay our bills, right? And literally, we used to joke that we ran the thing as like a socialist organization because we would pay each other based on what our expenses were you know if one guy had a car note and you know the other guy had a you know student you know you know student loan and somebody had you know two hundred dollars in rent the other guy had three hundred dollars in rent that's how we figured out what you get paid you just list your expenses and that's what we're going to cut checks for just so we can do this uh, I hope nobody know, included the girlfriends in some of these expenses. Time, yeah. No, it was, it was pretty above board. Yeah. You know, fortunately, we were in New Orleans where it was, you know, generally inexpensive to live. And we were we were all, you know, um, you know doing a little other things on the side, bartending. Well, um, this is this is where I was going with this because um, I uh, because I spent so much time in New Orleans, uh, the <laughs> very good friend of mine, Howie Kaplan. Uh, reminds me every time I talk about Bonnaroo, he oftentimes reminds me that don't worry, Brad. The reason Bonnaroo exists is because of the Howling Wolf, because <laughs> the Superfly guys started right here. Well, that was certainly one of the venues uh -huh. that we were working in heavily. Um, you know, the Howling Wolf, Tipitina's, Maple Leaf. Um, and then like a lot of, um, you know, venues that were sort of off the radar, like uh, the Riverboat, Cajun Queen, and the Masonic Auditorium that's mm -hmm. at, uh, on the 13th floor of 666, no, no, sorry, 13th floor of 333 St. Charles Avenue. <laughs> Uh, we, we did some shows up in there. Um, and then as we kind of started to graduate a little bit, we started to use some of the theaters, um, the Sanger Theater, the Orpheum, the State Palace. Um, and, you know, really, you know, our Jazz Fest event, and you know, it's, you know, relevant right now because the first weekend of uh, Jazz Fest, sorry, the second weekend of Jazz Fest is, is just ki kicking off today right now. Mm -hmm. My wife's down there having fun. And, um, you know, it... it um, that event, like our night shows during that and the sort of the energy that was formed around that really became the basis for us thinking, oh, you know what, maybe we can take this energy and do it in a place where we could have full control, where, you know, people could can't come and camp and kind of create a much deeper experience. But in a lot of ways, it was similar because we were working with a lot of the same artists and there was sort of a community thing that was starting to happen around these uh, night shows that we were putting That's on. where I wanted to go back um, when you were talking about it. So you Superfly was basically five years old uh, in 2002 when Bonnaroo started. So, um, and it reminded me, we had Ken Weinstein on, 
a couple of years ago and he told the story and I want to get your take on it. Um, it was basically a phone call to him that said, Hey, we've got this event. We don't even have a name yet. I don't think. And it's going to happen. in what did he say, Brad, like six months or eight months? It was pretty soon. But then he remembered that moment when you and I guess the, your partners and Ashley all ended up on the stage um, at on Sunday night looking out at that ginormous crowd and, and thought, uh, I think we can do this. This this might be a thing. Um, first of all, did he remember yeah. it right? And if he did, what was – tell he that – tell, yeah. tell your version of it, I guess. Yeah, Ken, who, you know, just to uh, remind everybody who's listening in here, Ken uh, has been and is the – it was from the very beginning and it still is the, the publicist for uh, Bonnaroo. Uh, incredible guy, incredible business uh, partner to us as we were getting this going. A lot of the early work around how we message, you know, what the festival is all about to the, you know, industry and, the you know, all that kind of stuff. Ken was really, uh, you, know, in, you know, influential in. And... Um, uh, yeah, I met Ken because he represented the band Galactic, and we were managing Galactic at the right around the time we were formulating uh, the idea around Bonnaroo, um, and so you know we just started this friendship around that and working relationship, and so he was the first person you know I, I thought of when we, we needed somebody to help us with the PR messaging, um, and yeah, that moment that you were talking about there, Barry. Uh, it's kind of a little embarrassing almost that we did that. You know, it's something none of us would ever really do again. And we didn't uh, ever do after that. But I think there was a tradition, you know, in the in the music world of, you know, where the promoters and the producers would sort of, you know, MC a little bit. Bill Graham did that famously, right? You listen to a lot of, you know, old, you know, Grateful Dead uh, you know, bootlegs or whatever, where, you know, there's somebody introducing the band and it's Bill Graham. And then, you know, you, you know, Quint Davis, uh, who's, you know, huge legend in the, you know, music festival scene, the guy who created Jazz Fest, you know, he does some MC stuff. But I think those guys is like, they have a different level of, of, of stature almost or something. And, um, you know, so we, I think, felt like this thing at the end of that first event to like, oh, we, we should go say thank you. And so we all went up on the stage and did that. I think we were all deer in the headlights. We have no business being up on stage. That's that's, that's not what, what, what we do. We should be in the background. And so my recollection of that moment was, uh, why did we just do that? Like, that was a little <laughs> scary and let's never do that again. Uh, but there also was a, a celebratory moment, of course. The fact that we, you know, that it actually happened. We actually pulled it off. You know, it's, you know, you can have a lot of dreams in your life and you can put a lot of dreams out there. And when some of those things come true, uh, it's pretty profound. And I, I think we just felt a certain level of gratitude at that point that we wanted let to express. Me, let me follow up real quick. Um, was it, I mean, you had just graduated college. So you guys all met sort of college age. So you, uh, was it a little bit that uh, hubris of youth that made you think you could put on an event that size? I mean, that's, that's, it was pretty, you did it without marketing. You did it without advertising. You, you did a camping event in the middle of Tennessee, uh, which now, you know, all of us looking back now say, well, yeah, it's been a huge success. But at that time, I mean, I'll be honest with you, even at my paper, which is 64 miles away, we didn't care until the morning of when we got the word that the traffic was backed up from, you know, here to Nashville. And then it became an issue for us. Was was it just that sort of, yeah. uh, hubris was it just naivete of youth or did you do you feel like you knew what you were doing and you knew it would do it would do well yeah well so two two things i'll pick up on there quickly uh barry you know that story you just told about you guys not really kind of paying attention until then uh, it wasn't just you i mean even the local community and even some of the powers that be that we were dealing with i, I think because it was you know, pretty underground. In other words, you know, like you said, we, there's no traditional advertising. It sold out right away. I think there was a lot of skepticism in general, locally, of whether this was real or not. And I have some great stories about the aftermath of that that I have to share sometime later. But to answer your, your question, um, 
you know, we, you know, I often, when I'm advising young entrepreneurs, which I, I like to do uh, from time to time, um, often kind of tell them that story about the fact that like, we didn't know what we right. didn't know. And that was very beneficial. Like, I, I don't know if I knew what I knew now, would I have ever started Bonnaroo? Right. So I, I'm not sure if it was hubris as much as uh, naivety a little bit, you know, like I think we, you know, the, the atmosphere that was surrounding, you know, the formation of Bonnaroo, there were a couple major things that were going on. But first and foremost, the, the Superfly partners, we were all going to a lot of festivals and events and we were looking really at the landscape of that stuff just as much as fans as we were from a business perspective, um, you know, we'd see these lineups of all these European festivals roll out and we we're like, oh my God, like if we could just go to something like that, that would be so fun. And none of us had the resources or ability to do that at the time. I think more, one of my partners maybe had been to a few uh, European festivals, um, but for the most part, you know, it wasn't that accessible to us. We were going to a lot of the smaller domestic festivals, things like High Sierra and Telluride Bluegrass, and there are a bunch of small festivals in the Northeast that don't exist anymore, you know, Berkfest being one of them. And we were sort of seeing what was going on there with the camping thing and sort of what, what there was forming around that. We had our Jazz Fest experience. So that was sort of like the soup that we were like, okay, like there is this thing going on here in terms of festivals that we isn't happening in America, but it's a thing that goes on in other places. And, you know, could we use the basis of what we were doing during Jazz Fest and some of these things that we're experiencing in a smaller fashion, could we do a mega version of that here, right? Like that was a, a lot of the real initial thing. Now from a business side, what you had going on was, this is really at the beginning of the formulation of what Live Nation is today, right? You had basically the consolidation of the concert industry, of the festival, or excuse me, of the concert industry kind of coming together. And I think at that time, um, you know, most of the, um, you know, general uh, industry was not focused on things like this. They were focused on the amphitheaters. They were focused on, you know, sort of the things that needed to come together in order to have that consolidation happening. Remember, this is in the wake of Woodstock 99. That was, right. you know, obviously, you know, publicized as a you know, disaster and all that kind of stuff. And so you had this sort of, I think, a, a little bit of like, you know, festivals are not as, you know, interesting for the mainstream industry. And you had a lot of uh, the other parts of the industry, like the agencies and stuff like that, because they were seeing this consolidation, they were encouraging folks like Superfly and AC Entertainment to get together, to know each other. And in fact, you know, one of the ways that Ashley and I first connected uh, was through, you know, an agent, uh, Tom Chauncey, who's a great friend of all of ours um, and represents a lot of amazing artists. He kind of was one of the facilitators of like, hey, you guys should know each other, you know, in this sort of consolidated business, the independent guys can have some strength by coordinating. Um, and so, um, you know, that that when we all kind of got around this, you know, look, our expectation was not that it was going to sell out in two weeks was not that we were going to sell 70,000 tickets the first year, to be clear. We, we were, would have been happy if we just, you know, got it done and we got out of it alive and, you know, didn't lose money. And, you know, if we had sold 30 or 40,000 tickets or something like that at that time, I think we would have felt like, wow, we did a festival of this big and like, that's great. And we got the poster. That was always an important thing to us is get, getting, you know, the poster with all the names on it, the Superfly logo and that kind of stuff. Like that, that was really our expectation. So I, I think it was part um, you know, just youthful enthusiasm and naivety and part, you know, having our finger on the pulse of kind of where the fans were at because we were the fans, right? We would have been the first people to buy a Bonnaroo ticket. I promise you that if somebody else had done it, we would have been the first in line, you know, flag waving, ready to go. And so I, I think a lot of it was really, you know, uh, com coming from that place more than anything. When you uh, started putting this together and, uh, you, I mean, as the really first go around in, in making a festival, what were some of the challenges? What was the biggest challenge that you ran up against? What was the thing that made you say, I don't know if this is going to work? Well, there was, uh, you know, one big uh, 
factor that we had that gave us a certain degree of confidence that we could pull it off. Um, and um, look, the biggest thing that Superfly had done before then was, you know, a series of concerts during Jazz Fest, the biggest venue being, you know, 3,000 people and no camping or anything like that. Ashley had done a small festival called, I believe, Mountain Oasis, but it was, you know, a few thousand people or something. So he had a little bit of a framework for that. But um, what we really benefited from early on is that um, we were able to tap into the team of people that had put on the large scale fish events. Um, and so, you know, fish was on their hiatus at that time. And I had built a relationship with the fish uh, team through uh, being one of the sort of facilitators of creating Oysterhead because Oysterhead, the, the band Oysterhead with Trey Anastasio, Les Claypool and Stuart Copeland was sort of formulated around one of our uh, Jazz Fest super jams. Right? That's where the super jam comes from, by the way, for, you know, uh, Bonnaroo, which, you know, we, we can talk about that if you guys want at some point. But the genesis of that, that had been a concert series very similar to what happens at Bonnaroo now that we had been doing for many years during Jazz Fest and other times a year in New Orleans. And we we got to know, you know, some of the, the people in the fish universe through that. And so when we were initially talking about this, I, I started to call a bunch of them, uh, you know, starting with John Paluska, who was Fish's manager at the time. And I think from his perspective, you know, he wanted to keep that team together a little bit. He, you know, he, he didn't want them to just kind of all go their separate ways and not continue that sort of muscle memory of doing things at this scale. And they also, I think they had like a lot of equipment that they wanted to rent to us. So there was a way, you know, it was beneficial for them. And, you know, to their credit, they were incredibly gracious and generous with, you know, advice on, hey, if you're going to do it, here's how you do it. And so we really, from an operational standpoint, um, you know, the fact that we were able to tap into that crew of people, um, you know, it, it gave us a lot of confidence. Of course, you know, some of the challenges that unfolded, right? The, the traffic and, you know, some of the logistics. I mean, when I think back on the level that we produced the event at the first year, uh, you know, I, 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 it's not something I like. I'm that proud about. I'm proud that we did it and that it was safe and that, you know, everybody got in and out eventually. And, it, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the basis for what it became. But as, as somebody sort of who was intimately involved in the operations and the setup of it, you know, uh, we all knew that uh, we had a lot uh, to improve upon after yeah, that. You, first had, year. you did have a and second. So, one, so. That's huge. <laughs> we did. And, and we learned a lot in that one, too. Yeah. And we learned a lot well, in the third yeah, one. Which, when which, it which year out. do you think you finally hit the uh, started getting things right and organizationally making sense? And when do you think you finally got in the pocket? Well, I, I had sort of said to everybody at the beginning, after the first year, I would say, that I wanted to be really good at it after five years. And I wanted to be able to just show up after 10 years. Now, that that didn't really happen, <laughs> but closer to reality than not. But I, I'd say it took us a good four or five years. You know, we, we needed to experience, um, you know, a, a, a wider range of things, right? And we needed to build a, a certain amount of infrastructure, like, for instance, the exit into the site, right? Like we needed that. We needed to build more roads. We needed to put drainage into the property. We needed to put in permanent electrical and things like that. And so, but I felt like after five years, we, we kind of had a lived enough of it. We had had horrible rain. We had had dry seasons before that caused dust. Like we, we had sort of experienced most of what, you know, the, the, variability of elements and, and situations are. And I felt after 10 years, we were getting pretty good at it. Um, well, I mean, so, I think you know. once there's two things here. Yeah. Because there's, I always said that that torrential rainstorm in that third year really felt like a game changer. You know, it was one of those, we're going to test you to the nth degree and shake you as hard as possible. And we're going to see if you're going to survive this. And then a couple of years later, you had the dust storm that was just, absolutely awful it really sort of crafted the the space a little bit differently but all of that becomes a lot easier and you correct me if i'm wrong but a lot of that comes a lot easier when so many of the other things 
were done right, like for instance, the user experience. You keep talking, you talked earlier about not naming the stages. And one of the very first shows that Barry and I ever had was the reason I love Bonnaroo so much is because they always took into account the user experience and I don't feel like I'm getting sold to every right. time I turn I've, I've said that since the beginning. And I don't feel like they have their hand in my wallet. That's right. And so when you get some of those basic things that so many festivals miss, I think the other stuff eventually comes around and, and becomes a little bit easier because you're not worrying about the, the, the things that you have to hire 15 PR teams to do. Yeah, you know, it really relates to what I said earlier. We were the fans, right? We knew that some of those things would not be, you know, done in a way that maybe they were happening in other places wouldn't work for the Bonnaroo, you know, demographic that we thought would want to come to this. And and it, because we were the same, it was easy to know, right? Um, and... Um, look, we, we had the advantage of success, too, at the beginning, right? Um, look, art and commerce are difficult, right? And it's always hard to manage, you know, how you put something together that, you know, you really want to truly be a valuable creative experience and a really like something that people, you know, really benefit from. And at the same time, you know, you're you're running a business and you got you know, things that you're responsible for. And look, I, I don't think this is that different than what artists have to deal with, right? Like artists are both a artistic expression. That's why they do it, but this is their livelihood and it's a business. And so, you know, f figuring that out is always a challenge. And the more that you can do it in ways that you put yourself in the shoes of who you're trying to serve, right? And you kind of try and use your creativity to um, meet some of the needs that you have from a business perspective to marry that, that's where I think, you know, the basis of our success around the things you're talking about has come from is that that was really our volition all along, which is, hey, how can we make it feel good if we were the fan? And how can we make it also feel good and be a win for the various business elements that we were serving as well? And we still operate that way to this day on so many levels like that is guiding principle for what we do as a business no matter you know whether it's something we're doing for ourselves or something we're doing in service for somebody else uh that, that, that's I, how we work. i want to say this um brad and i've said this on the show many many times but you and and ashley and and the guys that, that, that founded this have given me personally so many unbelievable moments um concerts and shows from mccartney to Radiohead, I mean, just on and on and on, and thank you, but I don't know if you remember, you were also there, sitting right next to me at one of my all-time favorite, funniest moments ever on the farm, which was the, uh, the oh uh, god, oh god, Mr. here it comes, the Mr. Wait a second. I didn't know, Brad. I know Rick was, was Rick there, was sitting right I didn't next know Rick to me was there, the golf cart. yeah, oh, I had to bring god. it up, you won't, you won't well, remember, so we were doing the media tour, and you and I were in the golf cart. Quayar, Jeff Quayar was driving. Brad was in the back. And we were driving into Where in the Woods, which was brand new. And we round the corner okay. and they had moved the Mr. T giant head. And one of the great yeah. things we love is to pick on each other. And Brad hates to be wrong. And so he, he blurts <laughs> out, hey, it's Mike Tyson. And it's like beat one. Uh -huh beat two, beat three, and Quayar couldn't stand it anymore. He was so nice because he's leading the tour, right? And he finally says, no, it's Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know think we can there read. That. I he was know. sitting right next to me because I remember we were doing the tour uh, together. Oh, I had to bring it up because you're on the yeah. show with us. And, of course, Ridiculous. it's an opportunity to embarrass Brad. I thought I honestly thought you were going to say the day because that was that the same day that we uh, walked to the uh, what stage on a Wednesday. And I looked back and they I said, the, they moved I, don't that hill. That was, I think that was the year before. <laughs> yeah, that's another legendary what podcast issue. Okay, just because if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna bust my chops here, I'm gonna make something very clear that I, we have been fighting over for years, Rick. And you can be the judge and jury on this one because you're from New Orleans. You've driven up and down that street. Is it Calliope or Calliope? Uh, come on. I think it's Calliope. My man. My man. Thank you so much. 
Thank the you. Stage of yeah, this, collide. Yeah. The stage of Bonner nope. is collided. I, I had to think about that for a second because of that. I wanted to make sure I wasn't getting my uh, things confused. But yeah, I think it's pretty pretty sure it's Cali. I'm going to die on they moved the hill and it's Calliope. No, we, I have, we resolved uh, this last episode with Kyle. Yeah, all right. I don't care. He's literally the guy right. that started it. I'm going with him and not a we guy. We hijacked Kyle. the show. <laughs> Rick, we, I want to talk about what you, I want to <laughs> transition and then talk about what you got going now with Superfest. But uh you'd be as good as anyone what what do you think where do you think music festivals are today 2022 i know we're coming out of an unprecedented event uh that sort of hit the pause button yeah. um and it, it seems from where we're sitting that we've got a bunch of festivals un, unbelievable number uh fans have a ton of options um not just bonnaroo uh but boutique ones big ones small ones you know some of them in their backyard. Some of them they have to, you know, travel uh, a great deal. Uh, where do you see the industry right now? Um, well, look, I, I honestly don't pay a ton of attention to sort of the day-to-day -day machinations of what's going on out there. I'm pretty focused on the things that we, you know, work on. Um, but I think, um, you know, what you said is the case, like there's a lot more, um, you know, I would say diversity of festivals and, you know, it's being, uh, you know, become more niche here and there, right. Which is something we saw happening pre, um, COVID shutdown. And I think is just continuing to pick up kind of where it left off, which is interesting to me. I'm not sure I would have expected it that way. But I think, um, you know, things being sort of specialized and focused, whether it's an artist doing it or, a, you know, second or third tier city doing something, um, you know, just starting, you know, to become more and more niche sort of experiences. And, you know, we've always looked to uh, Europe, as sort of where the future is because when we first started this you know that was the case like everything in europe was you know many many decades more advanced in terms of the evolution of the festival market than it was in america all the way down to even the equipment that they had frankly over there tents and you know the like comparatively to what was available over here and um you know what you know you had certainly at the peak and i don't know where it is at now i haven't followed as much but of the you know european and particularly the uk festival market you, you saw a similar thing where there were just a lot of you know really niche orientated events um that kind of spurred off of the bigger things that were you know ha had been around and have been around for you know decades and i think it's a natural evolution of things and i think from a consumer standpoint it's it's probably really awesome, right, to have this amount of options and diversity and choice and, you know, accessibility um, to these things. Um, so, you know, in many ways, like, you know, look, the creativity being expressed through this is a real positive. Um, you know, this has been going on for eons, right? People gathering in this format, all the festival, whatever, you know, it is, it's been happening forever kind of thing. Nobody invented this and uh, it'll continue to happen and evolve and morph in ways that, um, you know, people driven by, you know, producers and people's imaginations, uh, as well as, you know, sort of what the market opportunities are. And I think we're just kind of in another, you know, kind of interesting evolution of that with the weirdness of, you know, coming back after COVID. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hear you when you say that, but do you think that the big three at least the big three american festivals you think they're in, you think they're in any sort of trouble uh you know I, I don't think so no what i'm seeing out there i mean look first off you know what, one of the really nice things for the market of that stuff is that you do have you know, very big companies that you know have a lot of resources and a, a lot of um, you know incentive to uh, continue these things on at a very high level and 
Um, so I, I, I think that, um, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, that that is a real benefit of the consolidation of our business, right, is, is that you, you do have, um, you know, businesses that can withstand the ebbs and flows of these things, because that is the nature of it, right? There, you're always going to have like any kind of business, you're going to have your high points and your low points. And really, you know, it's, it's having the access to capital and the ability to withstand those low points that make things durable. And that's very hard for a small business. And it's, a you know, not easy, but but easier for a large business. And I, I think we sometimes lose sight of like, you know, why some of this can be a good thing, right? It's easy to sort of maybe, you know, l look at what could be a negative around when, when businesses consolidate and things like that. Well, there, there's, there's good reasons for it. And sometimes those things are very beneficial to consumers. And so I wouldn't underplay, you know, that in any capacity. Um, you know, I, I think, look, what I'm seeing with things that I'm still involved with, I'm seeing really good signs, right? Like we're, we're doing great with a bunch of our experience related stuff and you know, some the, the remaining festival stuff that we have. And so um, I, I just think you're going to like anything, things are going to evolve and change and be lumpy a bit. And, you know, that, that's the nature of business. That's the nature of market. And the thing that you're involved in now, that's sort of in the same vein of highly curated, specialized uh, event operations, right? Is that what Superfest yeah, well, was sort of born from with that idea? Uh, well, Superfest is a new thing. I'm happy to talk about that. The other thing that, you know, we still produce these days is Outside Lands, uh, the festival in San Francisco's Golden Gate How Park. is it that it, all these that we've never been yeah, to uh, Outside Lands? I mean, it is one of the great ones in the country and have never been. Uh, it, especially knowing what we do. Yeah. Uh, I'm only going to blame you for that. <laughs> yeah, you should. Uh, Thanks. Uh, well, now you're getting the hang of the show, Rick. <laughs> My, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't take, it didn't take long, Brad. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, so um, no, man. I mean, you're crazy. You've been to New Orleans Jazz Fest. I well, assume. You, well, here's been... this is a very sore subject in this house. Uh, we moved to New Orleans two days after Katrina. Or, I mean, two days after Mardi Gras, two year, three years ago, and then two weeks before a global pandemic sent us all to the house. And we bought, we didn't buy, we, we rented a house inside of the Jazz Fest neighborhood. We were on Ursuline and we got that house specifically so we could walk to Jazz Fest. I get a job that brings me to Brooklyn in the city a week before <laughs> Jazz Fest, a month before Jazz Fest. Um, and you've never been to Jazz Fest. We missed Fest. three Jazz Fests, yes. But you've never, never been, been even prior. No, we got one Mardi okay. Gras in us, and then we got uh, no zero jazz fest. Oh, I love Mardi Gras, by the way. I'm a huge Mardi Gras fan, and personally, I'm I'm more interested in going to Mardi Gras than jazz. It was fest. it was I, one of the great. I, I love jazz fest too. I I it, it just for my personal things I'm interested in these days. It's it's, 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 one of the, it's the great two weeks of my life. It was legit two weeks yeah. of that. Yeah, on Mardi Gras is amazing. Very under underappreciated event nationally. I think people have a, a warped perception of what Mardi Gras. That's exactly. Really is, right. I mean, most people another... think thinks it's it's boobs in the French Quarter, and um, yeah. you, know, I, I, you don't see any of that. None of that exists. Nah. None of that exists. Yeah, so very deep cultural event with many many la layers and flavors. By the way, not to get uh, off on the there. tangent here, but the best part of uh, Mardi Gras for me was uh, Skull and Bones waking up on Mardi Gras Day. Uh, which is very, I can't tell you, if you, if you don't like doing things afternoon, uh, you wake up at five o'clock in the morning and you go to Treme, which is the oldest uh, African-American neighborhood in the country, and you watch this uh, crew come out in this in full outfits, right? And the whole point of Skull and Bones is to walk around the neighborhood and beat on the doors and wake people up on Mardi Gras day. Um, and they, they chant through the streets. They've got an incredible... Uh, drum circle that they create. It, it It's one of the most magical Ooh, moments cool. of my life. It is very cool. Um, Super fast. So, where were we? Uh, so, well, we Sorry. were at Outside Lands still. For So, you, you got to make it to Outside Lands. You maybe go to Jazz Fest first. Uh, although, you know, we're, we have Outside Lands in August this year. You guys are all invited. Come on out and come check it out with us. You'll, you'll, it, it will feel very different and very familiar at the same time, right? You will notice the style that we produce at and how things are done and sort of the, the, some of the look and feel. I mean, the, the line that's incredible, who, who is, 
who's mainly are you guys booking it yourself uh, most of the booking for Outside Lands uh, really happens with Another Planet, our partner uh, on that festival. So kind of like we partnered with Ashley at Bonnaroo, mm -hmm. we partnered with the preeminent local uh, Northern California promoter, Another Planet. They were sort of the, you know, uh, principals uh, behind Bill Graham Presents after Bill passed away. Um, they, for a time, ran that business and then kind of went off on their own and started, you know, uh, what is another planet. And they're awesome people. They're, you know, really close friends. They operate all the awesome venues here in the Bay Area, like the Fox Theater and the Greek Theater and the Bill Graham Civic and all that kind of stuff. And so because they're so um, good at and so entrenched in uh, the regular day to day booking of talent through this region, uh, they really handle that. And like you said, Brad, I mean, they, they do an incredible job. Like it's, it's, it's hard. It's yeah. really hard to book a festival. Yes. It, you know, people, you know, you know, some of the insight, like, you know, to share on that just quickly is that like, people are always questioning, why don't you have this band or that band? Or why is this man at the same time? And, you know, let me tell you, it's not for reasons because of the way the person booking the festival wants it to be, right? If, if the fest, if, if they could just wave a magic wand, it would all be perfect, but that's not how it works. You got a lot of, uh, you know, masters to serve there, all the different artists, their representations, their schedules, you know, their production, like it's a, it's a jigsaw puzzle on top of a jigsaw puzzle on top of a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, it's a really difficult job. So the people that do that, um, you know, uh, that do it really well are uh, incredible. And to talented. still do it mostly independently too, mind you. We're we're very fortunate to be in business with those yeah. folks and I, to, to I have actually, those partners uh, and sorry friends. To so, I heard, um, because you said jigsaws, I heard somebody describe it as putting a jigsaw puzzle together without a picture or shapes. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, it's probably pretty good. It's probably, and and, and yeah. having to you know negotiate with uh, you know some some uh, pretty you know strong willed yeah. people on the other side of the coin. So. Um, you know, so that that's that come out to outside lands, though, it's really it, it, it is, you know, what what really is for us for the way that I kind of for our history interpret it. It's in between Jazz Fest and Bonnaroo. It, it's taking the best of both. Right. You have sort of the advantages of a city festival um, in, in terms of the comforts that you get along with that and that format. Um, and then, you know, you have like this incredible uh, Bay Area culture to play with. And then you have the creativity of, you know, our, our team and what we do there. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it really is a special, special. And that's event. what this so, is. What year is this for Outside Lands? Uh, I think it's 14. Yeah, it's been, it's been a yeah. minute, hasn't it? It's right. Yeah. Yeah. We got it pretty dialed yeah. in. I mean, it's just, really I mean, what a, what a know. fantastic festival. Congratulations. The, um, so what? Thank you. Tell me about Superfest. I I read a little bit about this. Uh, it sounds exactly like you were talking about them. It sounds exactly like you were describing where the industry, where festivals, where live experiences are going in general. Yeah, although with a big uh, differentiation uh, in how we're doing it and what the idea of it is is. It's almost sort of we're kind of trying to reverse engineer how one creates a festival. Okay, so typically, you know, somebody like us comes up with the idea and figures out all the P's and Q's. Where is it going to be? Who's going to be performing? What you're going to spend on it? Like all of those things, right? And then you put it out to a community of, you know, you put it out in the world and you hope that people want to attend it and you hope – in like the case of Bonnaroo, that some sort of like, you know, you know, foundational community forms around that, right? Like that's what you're hoping to achieve when you do something like this. Um, and what we're trying to do with Superfest is kind of the opposite. We're kind of trying to start with the community, right? This is the idea is like, let's assemble a bunch of people who are, have a passion for festivals and experiences and music and culture and art and see if we can 
create something together that um, you know, in a way, sort of is a self fulfilling prophecy, right? That that because we're doing it with the community, we are going to know exactly what to build as much as you can before we do all of that work that I just mentioned before. Um, and the reason that we're doing this now, and the what what is sort of helping to pave the way and facilitate this, is. Um, a lot of the things that have arisen in the sort of broader world of crypto currencies and, you know, Web3 and, um, you know, th that whole sort of world of you know, NFTs and things like that. I know I probably said a bunch of words that some people know what I'm talking about and a lot of people probably don't, which is totally understandable. Um, and so I, I, I can walk you through it a little bit, but the way to really process it quickly right, is that what we're really trying to create is almost like a membership model, right, where people are joining sort of this organization, this this thing, right, is super fast, with the intention of being a member, right, and the way we're really kind of positioning it is like where people are really co-founders, right, we're inviting a community to help us create this thing from the ground up. And we're doing that in a way that is sort of comports with how communities are being created uh, around the crypto blockchain NFT sort of universe, uh, Web3 universe of things. And, you know, the way to think about a lot of that is really um, an evolution of how people are communicating and coming together to create communities, right? Like a lot of what precedes this is all the communities that have, you know, um, you know, been created because of the internet and because of digital communication and social media and things like this. And what's been plugged into this is a way of uh, really creating, you know, sort of value and ownership and digital ownership that applies to um, people coming together to support or participate in something collectively. And so we're hoping that we become great facilitators, right? We become the ones, the professionals who know how to do this, but can help a group of people coming together with that volition of creating something new and interesting and progressive. And like I said before, you know, like being done by the fans in the same way when we started Bonnaroo, we were the fans. Well, you know, we're not as much anymore, right? I'm a guy in my mid forties with, you know, uh, family and kids and, you know, I, I'm not out there, you know, uh, as much as, you know, understanding. And yeah, we have amazing people that work for us that do, but when you really bring together the fans to build something, you know, um, we think we can do something great. And I, I'll, I'll, Brad, I'll give you one other reference point too, for you guys. One is Mardi Gras, right? Like, think about how Mardi Gras is created by the people that are going to Mardi Gras. Yeah, you have a little bit of your floats and your, but those are the same thing. Those crews that put on the big Mardi Gras parades, they're just collectives of people, right? Who are put, pooling their resources together and paying their dues into those crews so you can have an Endymion parade or an Orpheus parade or whatever it may be, right? Um, the other reference point is Burning Man, which has been hugely influential to me. You know, I started going, um, you know, midway kind of into Bonnaroo, producing Bonnaroo, and, and frankly, a lot of the things that sort of became more of the community of elements of Bonnaroo were because we were inspired by going to Burning Man. And at Burning Man, most of the content there is created by the audience. It is created by people collectively coming together and saying, I want to build this really cool thing. And the reason I want to do it is I want other people to have fun with it. I want it to have a positive impact on other people. And that's what I, we're trying to do. I hear, Superfest, I hear essentially, exactly what you're saying. And, yeah. and especially the Mardi Gras reference makes a lot of sense. But you're obviously creating something that's not linear. So this is a hard question to answer, but uh, how far along in the process do you think that you are? Oh, we're yeah. early. We're really early right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we are just forming the community. You know, we've got right now about, you know, 3,000 fairly active people in our Discord server. Discord is a platform that many of the crypto projects and Web3 <laughs> projects sort of use as their sort of, you know, social communication platform. 
Um, and, you know, it's active. We did this thing yesterday called a, a Super Jam, not, not surprisingly, where we, ha- we opened it up to the community to have a creative uh, brainstorm on things around what do we want to create? What kind of format do we want this experience to be? Is it a traditional thing with bands on stages or is it something a little different than that? Right. And so um, we had an amazing dialogue. You actually can go in there and listen to it. It was like incredible listening to people who have been inspired by some of the things that we've done say, hey, I wish we could do this at a festival. Or I wish we could think about Are it. Are you this doing this way. on a regular basis? And, so yeah, how do I yeah, find yeah. it? Yeah, we're doing it on a regular basis. So uh, go to the Twitter handle first. It's at Superfest, and the Superfest is spelled with a three for the E. So it's S-U-P-E-R-F-3-S-T. That's at S-U-P-E-R-F number three S-T, right? That that Twitter feed is sort of the, the you know, sort of starting point for communication. From there, you can click on the link to get into the uh, Discord server. And, um, you know, that will, um, you know, uh, unlock that whole social experience that I just talked about being able, you know, to sort of interact with the whole community. Um, and what, what, so yeah, go, go spend some time in there, check it out. You know, there, there'll be the way these things work is there will be a moment within, you know, sometime likely in June where we'll do what's called a mint. And a mint is where people essentially buy their membership, right? Best way to think about it. And so, you know, we're, we're going to be issuing essentially 3,000 uh, founder, uh, you know, membership tokens, right? The ability to sort of buy that membership. The initial group will be 3,000 people. Now, as we sort of go and figure out what we're going to do and figure out how to you know, uh, marshal the resources to do that. We'll, we'll do, you know, other future mints that will give people access to the events and things like that. But that's the starting place of how we're doing it. And, um, very different way of doing things, do you have but any it's very fun and exciting to be part of. Or is it too early? Of. Do you not want to try to put a, a, a limit, a boundary on? Okay. Yeah, it's really too early. And, you know, the answer to many of these things not everything, right? There are things like safety and security and operational plans and, you know, uh, business modeling and budgeting that, you know, will be the domain of Superfly, right? But most of the things are going to be around that are going to feed off of what the community wants. This is not for me to be making the decision as a producer. This is me to be facilitating what the community wants. And so some things will be conversational, right? Brainstorms and just getting general input. Yeah. Some things will be a vote, right? And each each uh, super pass holder will have one vote. You buy 10 super pass, you can have 10 votes. But essentially, we are going to put up a whole bunch of things for the community to decide on or give us guidance on, Right. And that that is kind of a, it's new. We're this is an experiment. We have it could be, you know, a disaster. It could be amazing. It won't I mean, be. Disaster. You guys haven't really done one of those yet. You know, yeah, yeah really. we don't. In terms of when I say a disaster, I mean like, hey, maybe nobody will care, right? Nobody will be interested, and it won't be anything. Um, in terms of the actual producing of the experience, of course, you guys know how we do it, and we would never do something that wasn't going to be safe and, you know, run in a way that was, you know, appropriate for, you know, taking care of people as they come to something that we create. That that that's you know, twenty five years of history of of of, uh, of delivering that. We always will, but. Um, you know, uh, what we don't, this has never been done before. This has literally never been done before. Nobody has ever started a festival this way. It's the I first it's time so, anybody has taken so this approach. And um, we think it's a really cool way to be thinking about things right now. And to, you know, to your point earlier, Barry, like, you know, frankly, I don't have a ton of interest in just going to build another, you know, traditional festival. I, I'd never say never in the right situation, the right moment. If I feel we can do something that, you know, adds value to the world, then fantastic. But the idea of doing it this way, this really lights me up. This is exciting to me to take our skill set, experience, our history, and apply it to this new mode of doing things and to do it in a way that, 
you know, frankly, um, you know, kind of hits on some of the things that, as I mentioned, you know, the way that, that, you know, uh, some of these other experiences are produced that are affecting me in my life very positively. If we can create something that has a similar dynamic for people. I think it's just people, fascinating then, given uh, what we've talked about for the last hour because you're combining that, uh, I won't call it naivete because you don't have naivete, but you're trying to, it sounds to me like, capture that sense of we don't know what's going to happen and that's what's exciting coupled with we do kind of know what's going to happen because we have 22 years worth of of doing this so i would think part of the challenge is for you you with your experience to get out of the way basically you know you don't want to be the guy at the table saying that won't work and here's why you know you want to be the guy saying that's a crazy idea let's figure out how to make it work let's do it let's yeah. get a try it's made work. Well, you, yeah, you're right. I mean, Barry, you know, it's a really astute uh, perspective you're having, and I'm going to have to do my best to do that because, you know, my role uh, for a long time in our organization was to be the pump the brakes guy a little bit, you know, and to be the, hey, yeah, that's not that practical. And so we actually had a conversation about this this morning on this project that, like, you know, one of the things that I found interesting when we did the Super Jam yesterday is that a bunch of the people who were throwing out ideas when I would was giving some feedback, they were like, oh, my God, this is so great to have a professional who knows what they're talking about and has done this to help inform us of what really can happen and what maybe, you know, shouldn't happen. Right. And so, you know, that's a responsibility I'm going to take really yeah. seriously on this is not to be a dream killer. Right. Because it's easy to be that. Right. And at the same time, you know, be a responsible, practical steward of uh, trying to enable this community to build something that really can happen. Right. And that that is the that's the goal. That's the volition. We need to create something that really represents um, the wishes of this community in a way that uh, is safe and, you know, fiscally sound and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that that's a cool challenge uh, to do. It's a cool challenge, a hard challenge to do when you're just dealing with a couple of business partners. It's a whole nother ball game when you're dealing with thousands of people. And um, but I, I feel like the people that are going to be attracted to this are going to have the right volition of, of doing something great and doing it in the proper way and following, you know, the guidance that we have in, in terms of the things that, um, you know, really matter. And so it's, it's, it's already been a pleasure. We're literally at the very beginning of this. Um, so I, I, you know, uh, invite everybody to come check it out a little bit. Um, this is not to be meant to be, you know, a, uh, the re, you know, the, a, um, a replacement for the kind of festival experiences that people have, right? Like, you know, I think if you go to Bonnaroo, you'd want to go to this as well. Maybe not instead of it. I, I don't think so, right? This is going to be a very different experience, you know, than, than what you would get with something like Bonnaroo. And, um, you know, one, one of the things I, I want to just say, I, I, I got to probably run in a few minutes and it's been delightful talking to you, but one thing I wanted to make sure I got in before we ended here is that I am so excited to go myself to Bonnaroo this that. year. Is that... I, 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 I am beside myself, to be honest, that I can now go experience Bonnaroo. Is it because you fan. haven't done it and, as a fan before, or is it? Be, or is there certain things about the, the lineup, yeah. the, the festival that you're really excited about? No, no, because I've never done it as a fan. You know, I mean, I, my Bonnaroo experience has been now, are you working. Rick Farming I mean, not to say, I, I, <laughs> <Okay>. no. <laughs> I got extra room in the bus. No. <laughs> I got too much built up, uh, ne potentially negative karma that if I camped at Bonnaroo, I am confident that everything bad would happen to me. Uh, no, I, I'm I'm gonna stay in a you know RV type of situation because that's what I'm used to at Bonnaroo and and at this point in my life that that's the comfort that I need. Um, but um, I um, you know my Bonnaroo experience, although don't get me wrong, I've had a lot of fun moments out there and I've experienced the festival, you know, in a really enjoyable way. But you know, I, I was always had a lot of responsibility, 
you know, whether it was to the business part, uh, whether it was to having lots of friends and family and business yeah. people that I'm hosting there and like a whole, it was, you know, major, major part of our, you know, livelihood and business life the whole way through. And so now that I get to just come, I'm going with my brother, a bunch of our friends, my wife, you know, we're just going to go have a blast. And I, I just, the idea of being at Bonnaroo and not having to worry about where I am at a particular time or who I have to go meet with or what thing I have to go do or I like, and I want to do all this, this stuff that like my friends have been doing for years. Like one day I want to go get breakfast at Waffle House. I've never done that. You know, I've never done a lot of the things out there that, you have know, you, have you, um, you know, many have, people. Did you ever, in any of the so. days, did you ever go to the Christmas barn late at night? Did you go to any of the late night parties on GA? Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, you, okay. a little bit. Yes. No, I, I've experienced it all in that regard, but always with like some, you know, n not in a full blown way. Right. I've always had to sort of, you know, just be you know, in the moment and, you know, I get it. this is, this, this was work, right? I, like I have not been able to ever fully let loose I, and just I know, enjoy I love, I love the and idea that, that Rick's cool. idea of letting loose is going to Waffle House in the morning. <laughs> that is pretty good. Well, I get it. that's part of it, but it's just, uh, it's just not it. having no, responsibility, it, frankly, you know, and that, 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 that's like, you know, I, I don't know. I, you, you like the only analogy I can give, it's not a good one, but like things like this, you care so much about them. They're, they're almost like a child, right? Like you care about it so much and you have such a responsibility to it, you know, that like, you know, you, you know, what ha in some ways the way I feel now is that like our, our, you know, child is an adult and it's able to fully care for itself and I can still, you know, experience my child, right? As I know many of my friends who have adult children who are like, now I can go hang out with my adult child as a peer, as a friend, you know? And I, I think that's what Bonnaroo is going to be like for me, right? Which is like, it'll still always be something that we have feel, you know, very connected to in the creation of, but I don't have the responsibility sure. of being but you that get to be steward. A fan again. You know, you, for the first time in a long time, you get to be a fan. You're going to bring a notepad? Yeah, you're right. Take no, notes I... just to share. Okay. No, All right. No. Good. No, I'm just yeah, you don't have to look around and not worry about any of that. that garbage can. And, um, just somebody really... should pick up that cup. It... <laughs> no, I get it, man. No, I get it. Just get to go and have fun, you know. Well, good for you. It, you know, I, I okay. want to um, uh, first off, I thank you so much for the time. I, it's it's tremendous, and um, you know what you and Ashley did. I said it to Ashley Caps, and Barry makes fun of me, but it really did change lives. You affected so many lives, and you damn near saved uh, the music industry. Um, so, you know, thank you for that. Thank you for your time. I want to hopefully, at some point, pull you back into this ridiculous hemisphere, uh, maybe before Bonnaroo, and tell some Bonnaroo stories. And just go deep into, you know, your your well of Bonnaroo information. I'd love to hear uh, some perspective from you on that. And then maybe after Bonnaroo, hearing yeah, about yeah. how it was as a fan. Well, I, I appreciate you guys. Love what you do. Love that you're propagating the Bonnaroo culture and vibe. And, uh, you know, for as long as I'm here, I'm going to be doing that. I, you know, um, I, I care deeply about the festival and the community around it. And I, I um, you know, want to continue to do everything I can to push that forward. And so thanks for, for what you guys do and for your time and, uh, you know, uh, happy to, to, to yeah. shit, shit with y'all, uh, whenever. Also, whenever what, what, what are you playing right now? What's on the turntable back there? What's the last thing you played? Uh, a lot <laughs> of things have been broken for a while. Much to my wife's chagrin, every time she comes in here, she kind of gives me a little like... The record player's got COVID. Huh? Fixed already because she, <laughs> she loves that. Most of these records, frankly, are her. I, I, I'm a... I'm a, a digital guy living in a digital world. I joke with her. She's an analog girl living in a yeah. digital world. And so she gets frustrated that she can't just put something on and press a button. Well, um, but um, no, look, there's so much good music yeah. out there these days, man. Well, I mean, you got my favorite you know, band in the world right I, now at the Outside Land's yeah. Wet Leg. Uh, 
you know. Oh, they're great. Oh, yeah, that's that's terrific. Absolutely. Have to check that out. Th- thank you, Rick. Rick, thank, thank you. you so Seriously, much. Thank you. All right, there you go. Rick Farman, I'm going to say part one of our conversation yeah. <laughs> because I feel like we've got multiple more to go with him. I hope so. I hope so because, yeah, you – you know he has some stories, the funny stuff, the behind the scenes stuff, the I mean you ask him about, you know, what are the, the what were the challenges. I felt like we could have we could have gone deep. Hour. Yeah, we could have gone an hour on that kind of stuff. I mean, so. I want to talk to him just about the rainstorm of the third year because Lessons I can't learned. imagine how that changed everything. Uh, I've told this story a hundred times when I woke up that morning after the major rainstorm and we were two feet sunken into the ground and a random kid with a ATV was pulling cars out of the mud. I mean, it was an absolute shit show. And, you know, if I was them, I would look around and be like, I don't know if I want to do this. Ever again. Yeah. The, and the, the I same for this? the, I, I remember going to bed that night watching the lightning thinking I'm going to die because I'm in a pup tent, you know, I'm not going to survive this, but also the dust storm. Yep. You two know, years later, I, the dust I storm remember walking storm. out into the center later. room and the parade and thinking, oh, they, they're putting off smoke bombs. This, these people spare no expense. And then I realized it was dust. And then I mm-hmm. thought, I've got Legionnaire's disease. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how much of a hypochondriac you were. Barry. Well, Jesus. I'm breathing. I couldn't see, you know, my hand in front of me. I thought, this is, this is people's funk. Uh-huh. Uh, this is not good. So, uh-huh. yeah, they've overcome a lot of things. And, uh, you know, to hear him talk about they didn't expect 70,000 people that first year. Imagine that, you know, it's the old, you throw a party and invite 10 people and a hundred show up, you know, uh-huh. kind of a big deal. So yeah. it was great. It was great talking to him. Yeah. It's uh there's a lot of area, area to cover. That's for sure. Guys, I uh, miss you. And I hope uh, I see you again soon. Well, wait, uh, wait, wait. There you, go. Wait. you You cut off my shaking knees. Oh, is, is there more shaking knees? Yeah, that's fine. I'll just I'll throw out a shout out to uh, the dashboard mom. She wanted me to mention her. Oh, oh you had a so. dashboard mom? Yeah. Oh man. What else did I yeah. miss on shaking these talk? What you else? Tell. Did we... I don't know. You cut me off, so you oh, didn't I'm get sorry. the rest of it. I was trying to get to Rick. <laughs> we got a long show. We got a long show. Yeah. All right. Hold Go hold ahead. Go ahead. hold that conversation about. <clears throat> excuse me. Hold that conversation about shaking these, and we'll talk about it next mm-hmm. week. Do you need to hold up a picture or okay. tell her any specific? <laughs> you got to. Any any mess, you know, is that it? <laughs> she asked for a shout out, so I had to throw it in. Well, there you go. Well, I want to hear yeah. more about shaky knees. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So put a pin in that and we'll come back to it next week, okay? Okay. Because yeah, hopefully next time it we're, turns out we're... we need content for next week and I got another. Well, I mean, hopefully next time we'll have the schedule. It, it should be coming out pretty soon. I've asked and not gotten any answer, so the 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 times and all. So. You think it would come out is is it normally middle of May? I mean, we're. I guess it is, yeah, because it's June, June 7th. Right yeah. corner, so. Okay, all right, yeah, so we got schedule and shaking his talk for next well, week. Put that in the books, kids. Uh, all right, okay. all right, talk to you next week on our podcast. Later. Consequence Podcast Network.